All right, Mason, and action. Say that again. I don't know how we're going to do this. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much for one week, especially when two of the days are already taken up by reviews and so forth. Everybody who loves the Benedict, raise your hands. <laughs> Apparently not the guys that wrote the curriculum pacing guide. Yeah, it's this is a uh, this is one of those weeks where you look at it and there. I mean, as I was just going through it today, getting ready to like discuss how I would teach it. Man, eleven through seventeen. There's I wouldn't. I wouldn't be doing. I wouldn't be doing any of the reviews. That's for sure. I'd be taking all five days in this section. Yeah, at least. <laughs> so, uh, um, so you've got assess your learning, and you've got D uh, doctrinal master review eight. You know what? I'm going to give you guys full permission. You 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 want to take five days, <laughs> and and you want to be in a Benedi, do it. If you're like, listen, it's May, and I need variety for variety's sake, do it. But this is going to seem like it's hyperbole. But time but here we go. <laughs> but time in these chapters is like a thousand times more valuable than any doctrinal mastery review that you can do. Go ahead and, and explain I'm that. Saying that those aren't valuable and, and we are late in the semester. And and maybe the idea of spending five days working through really can can be dense scripture. Maybe that doesn't sound very appealing, in which case I echo Ricky, like y'all got to make it to the end of the semester and survive too. But this is, this is like a doctrinal fountainhead for the rest of the Book of Mormon. And we're just, we can't blow through it. Like, like it's just, oh, oh yeah, he's quoting scripture again. Let's, let's go ahead and uh, summarize and move on. Right. Yeah. Yeah, so it's it's definitely I was looking at it going, you know what? This is one of those weeks where it it, it is so doctrinally dense. It has so many different elements to it. E even if I were to try to cut away um the narrative away from the doctrinal side of things, like the narrative is one thing. Like uh, everything that's happening to the people and, and what it is that he's preaching to him in, in response to what the leaders are doing and then how they react to his message and his pronouncement of prophecy. Like separate that just from what chapters, is it starting in 12? Is it uh, <clears throat> where, where he really starts getting into what he's trying to teach him? Yeah, it's 12 through 16 that solid, like just walking through, there's a reason why when Mormon was putting this story in here, he slows way down and includes all four chapters of Abinadi's argument and reasoning. Like the, the way he does his, his message is so intricate, so powerful. Yeah, this is one of those ones where I feel the same way as you, Mason. How do we approach this? And not only that, you think about how we get this text, right? How do we get Abinadi's words? And it's probably from Alma that we're getting these, right? And and what's Alma doing with these words? He goes off and founds the first church of Christ in the Book of Mormon. Like this is the founding text for the Church of Christ. And, and we, you know, we're just belaboring the point at this point, but this is really <laughs> important stuff. So, so let's, let's, all right. So big picture is, holy smokes, there's a lot of stuff. So let's, let's like, let's kind of start talking ideas then. What, what are some approaches, some hooks, like how would you, how would you kind of approach some of these chapters? And you can do, if you want to talk narrative, if you want to talk doctrine, just let's just kind of share some ideas and then let our teachers kind of pick it out of the heap of things that they could choose from. Well, students, students are going to gravitate towards narrative and let's, let's, let's let them, let's, let's tell the story and let's talk about kind of where does a Benedict come from and what's his, what's his purpose? Why is he there? Um, and it's, and it's going to be a natural conclusion because it's going to lead to his, his, his ultimate death. And it's a story that they're very much familiar with. 
mostly because the art that goes around goes along with this is is pretty epic um to show some things and to highlight some some different so i i would start i i would just start there and i would maybe my hook would just would be to talk about kind of the idea of of trust i might ask them um you know how how important is trust when when receiving a message from somebody like if if somebody were telling you or trying to correct you or warn you like how important is the relationship with the person who is offering the warning in your ability to listen to it right and i would just i would just start there and just kind of start talking about you know if if it was somebody that that you knew was trustworthy and they were giving you a warning you're probably listening to that much, much more closely than somebody you would perceive to be an antagonist or an enemy, right? And then, and so that kind of gets us into the conflict of the narrative is, you know, Noah or uh, Benjamin, uh, blah, Abinadi, <laughs> let me get to the right guy here. Oh, yeah, Abinadi comes on scene, sounds like he is a member of what he's a member of their community. He's he's been there from maybe he is with Zenith. We don't know how old he is. We we think we have an idea just because of artwork that shows him as a as a you know a, a very muscular old man. Um, but he is a member of this community who has watched this transition from Zenith to Noah. And he's deeply troubled by by what he sees, and and I, you know, and I think just very simply, you could take five or ten minutes and go through verse eleven and just put your students in there and go, all right, you got you got you got five minutes to tell me why you feel like a prophet needs to be sent to this people, and just let them go through. In fact, I wouldn't even not the whole chapter. I just have them go through the first fifteen verses. Okay, go through the first fifteen verses, and I just want you to identify. Why do you think a prophet was probably sent to this people? Can you can you see any reasons why God might be concerned about it, this little branch of his covenant people? I, I probably wouldn't do the first 15, but I'd probably take it all the way through at least 19, because after they have a battle with the Lamanites, do they also kind of show their pride behind everything as well? But that may be a good approach to it. Um, I, I was thinking of a different hook. I'm always trying for a little bit of shock and awe. But uh, maybe maybe my hook would be um, why would why would anybody kill a prophet? Kind of taking from in uh, chapter six or seven. Um, that's when uh, Lim Hai is talking about why it is that they've had so many problems, and and he talks about the fact that <clears throat> they killed a prophet. They killed a chosen man of God, and uh, they put him to death because he said all these different things. And and if anything, just to get them into understanding what was really going on, what what, what is the storyline? But I don't want to spend a lot of time there. Like, no, I, I agree. I don't. I don't think this should be any more than than five minutes to just set up, just to kind of set the stage. Yeah, yeah. Mason, how would you dive in? So, so I I, I think chapter eleven is super important to establish the context. I would take flattery. That's that's my term that I'm focused on because it sets me up perfectly to get into to Abinadi's arrest. And I'd I'd talk about what flattery is, and I'd talk about how, you know, given this is the type of king and the type of group of priests that we're working with, what kind of things might they tell the people? that even though they're overtaxing the people, even though they're taking their daughters and mistreating them, even though what all of these corrupt things, they're still flattering them. What kind of things might they tell them? Right. And I'd kind of build out what flattery is. And then, you know, I think the prophecies of destruction are super important, but you could jump right to chapter 12, verse 13 to when Abinadi comes back after two years and the people take him and say, oh, now, O oh king, what great evil hast thou done or what great sins have thy people committed that we should be condemned of God or judged of this man? And now, O oh king, behold, we are guiltless and thou, O oh king, hast not sinned. Therefore, this man has lied concerning you and he has prophesied in vain. Right. So 
this this people has this image they're chosen they've been flattered into believing that they're chosen they've built all these fine buildings they're using wealth and women to display how how chosen they actually are right and and then you peel it back just a little bit more what do the priests say oh yeah of course we we use the law of moses it's like today we get politicians on across the political spectrum who who can't stop talking about the constitution they say they're the true they're the true uh, representatives of the constitution and the other side is the one that's violating it how can that be it's because the the constitution just like the law of moses here is acting as a smoke screen as a tool of flattery to say check we're doing this yeah. so that we can justify all of the other things we're doing and that actually sets us up for the question that they ask Abinadi. Right. In in chapter 12 uh, about Isaiah 52, 7 through 10, which is this. I mean, these might be the most important verses in all of scripture. They appear in every single standard work we have. And, and the idea is that this is the moment of covenant fulfillment for Israel, where, where God's covenants are being restored to a people that's scattered and destroyed. And, and this is actually the, the set of verses that Paul takes the word gospel from, these good tidings, right? This is the proclamation of the gospel. And this is the question that they ask Abinadi, what does this mean? Because they have used this type of language to flatter the people into thinking that we've arrived. And now that we've arrived, we can do whatever we want, right? Including taking taking all of your resources including taking your daughters including using your sons to defend our lavish lifestyle and so there's this really clear thread that leads us right into their question and and Abinadi we don't know Abinadi maybe Abinadi was a priest that got dismissed right but he clearly knows the scriptures he's and he's ready to go and he's ready to hit him on the law of Moses he asks this beautiful question um, that we just, I think we should slow down on in verse 27 uh, or in verse uh, verse 31 of chapter 12. He says, does salvation come by the law? What say you? Yeah. Right. And that's going to be this springboard into him teaching about, about the savior coming. So that's how I'd, I'd start with flattery and I'd get into this, into a as quickly as possible. It's, it seems like that that question for me seems like a ready-made kind of attention getter that that could be the foundation of the entire week is what what saves us. And in this case, he says, does the law of Moses save us? And he actually is going to spend the rest of his discourse ta talking about it. And, and the way they the, the logic he uses, he, he actually never really answers that question here. He doesn't answer that question until chapter 13. But he's that, that whole idea of what do you think saves you actually is going to be at the heart of his accusation against the priests, about his accusation with the people, their, their problems, their blind spots. Everything is all stemming from this question and how they answer what saves you. Right. And, and what do they really think saves them? Right. They really right. think it, it's it's the wealth, it's yep. the women, it's the power. And then they're going to use the law of Moses as, you know, this is probably not a 100 percent literate society. It's likely that the priestly class is the most educated, the most literate. Right. The law of Moses can be whatever they tell the people the law of Moses is. Right. And so they're just going to use that as their justification. I, I feel like this is like an intensely relevant conversation to have with our youth. It seems like as, um, as intentional as we feel we are in saying that our salvation comes through Christ, I feel, I feel like if I have that conversation with any early morning seminary teacher, um, they, they would all say that that's what they what their message typically is every day, right? Is that Jesus saves? Our our language often doesn't reflect this. Uh, we if if we were to ask our students what saves, they also may also say Jesus saves. But if we were to say things like, "So does 
does reading your scriptures every day save? Does 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 saying your prayers save? Does do the temple the, do temples save? If I get on a mission, is that what saves me? Like if we have those types of conversations, um, we think that we're making this uh, uh, argument explicit. But if I sit back and listen to to sacrament talks or to Sunday school teachers or to what I say as a parent and what I hear people say in responses to teachers, we actually say a lot of things save us. And here, here is Abinadi throwing that right in our faces. So you think commandments save? You think the law of Moses, your way of living the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's what saves? Or, or even less, you know, less aspirational than that. If we were to look at our lives as our answer, right? How, how do you spend your days? Where do you put your resources? Where do you put your energy? If you were to just analyze your life, what does your life say about what you think will save you? Right. And, and what about your social media feed? What do you think about that? Like, let's scroll through our social media feeds according to our social. What does the algorithm say we think saves us? Mm. <laughs> right. And and that's that's he's driving at this thing. And there's this beautiful quote in the book of Ecclesiastes. I love the book of Ecclesiastes. It's super depressing. And mm. and the classic quote is vanity of vanities. All is vanity. Right. And, and it's this idea that no amount of wealth or power or wisdom or even righteousness saves us. Uh, and we have to pair all of that back before we really get what, what message he's going to give us. I love it. Ryan, where would you go? What, what, what would, how would you start into Abinadi's actual prophetic message here? You know, how, um, how would you build on what we were talking about, or would you go somewhere completely different? No, I'm I'm looking at now chapter thirteen, because again, the narrative, this the the kids the kids reckon remember in the story that there's a point where the priests are not you know they're not super intent on listening to what he has to say, and they're going to try to take him away, and and he shocks them right, he's you know touch me not kind of thing, and. I, this time through, I, I noticed in, in chapter uh, 13, verse 3, when he says to touch me not, I guess I didn't notice this before. He said, God shall smite you if you lay hands on me. And then he says this, for I have not delivered the message which the Lord sent me to deliver. Neither have I, neither have I answered your question, right? You asked me a question, right? What is What do these verses in Isaiah 52 mean? Um, Mason did a beautiful job of kind of explaining where they see Isaiah 52 and, and these, these words, beautiful and peace and joy and comfort and, and eyes and salvation and, and good tidings. And isn't that us? So how can you and, say and, that we, and Abinadi, it's not you, your, your message yeah. isn't beautiful. You're, you're condemning us to destruction. Yeah, you're, you're threat you're threatening some, some pretty awful things. And so, I haven't delivered the message that the Lord has sent me to deliver, which is 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 this this message of repentance. Um, but neither have I. You've not you've not given me a chance to answer your question. So, so the to answer their question, then I, I'm looking at verse eleven, and he's talking about the commandments and are they not written in your hearts? And I was just thinking about how could we have another lesson about commandments with with teenagers because they they seem to get that lesson. A lot, right? And whether it's, um, you know, it's for your safety and you're happier, and 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 we give we give lots of really good reasons, it's, right? It, it's the netting and the sharks, right? It's that story <laughs> with the surfer, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And 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 while those are all those are all valid reasons, um, if you again thinking about about what you and and Mason were just talking about, I think. Maybe a, a hook or approach or an activity I might lead them in is all right. We got the Ten Commandments in chapter in chapter thirteen, right? We got we got part of them in chapter twelve. We get the rest of them in chapter thirteen. So we know there's ten commandments here, right? And and let's list them off on the board. And then I'm and then I might ask them, all right. So besides these ten, what are other commandments that we are asked to do and to obey? And and they might give us some more and, you know, the primary answers, reader scriptures, say our prayers, we get the word of wisdom, 
Um, I say, well, you know, commandments are also things that are, you know, sin is also things that we're, that we don't do. So what are some things that we might not be doing that we should be doing? And maybe, you know, have have I just, I want to put a list down. I just get a list of all of these check the box kinds of things. And then what I might do is, and I have that on one side of the board. And then what I might do is I might put the name of Jesus Christ on the other side, maybe a picture of him, maybe just his name and just have them list out titles and attributes of Jesus Christ. We just help me focus on who he is. Cause Abinadi is going to do this. Abinadi is going to point us using Isaiah 53 um, in chapter 14. And then he's going to expound on that in chapter 15. I might just have them. Who do you know Jesus Christ to be? What are titles that are meaningful to you? What are attributes that you feel like are most, are most precious and, and most supporting to your life? And, and put them on the other side of the board. And then in the middle, I might then write something to the effect, how will commandment X help me to become Jesus Christ attribute Y? And then have them start thinking in terms of, are these commandments actually written in your heart because of how they will transform you to becoming like Jesus Christ? And I would, and, and maybe I would try to have that conversation and say, okay, well then let's, let's look then at how, how, how Abinadi thinks, you know, cause in verse 27, salvation doth not come by the law alone. And were it not for the atonement, which God himself shall make for the sins and iniquities of his people, they must unavoidably perish, notwithstanding the law of Moses. So just because we have this list of commandments that then they in and of themselves obedience in and of itself is not what saves unless it transforms us into this, this attribute or character of Jesus Christ that we most want. And so if we could, if we could somehow take, keep the, the Sabbath day holy will then help me to be more meek and lowly of heart. Um, you know, not committing adultery is going to help me to be more whatever. Right. And if we could, with all of those link them to how it helps us and maybe even ask the question, how was Christ the perfect example of obeying that commandment? What, what did, what attribute was developed because he was this um, anyway, that's, I think that's where I would probably go next is I want to be able to link them. Okay. So if the law is not enough, then why do we have a law? Well, the law is there. Um, in verse uh, verse 31, behold, I say to you that all these things were types of things to come. And did they understand the law? No, they didn't. They didn't understand the law because of the hardness of their hearts. But if they understood that God himself would come down and they would see all these things that he would do for us, in um, chapter 14, verse 6, we have all gone astray. This list of commandments go ahead and raise your hands. If you are hundred percent obedient in all of these, like we've all come, we've all been, let, we, we, we've all made mistakes and not been hundred percent in keeping these commandments, but he was oppressed because we, we weren't perfect in keeping the Sabbath day. Holy. He was afflicted because we didn't, um, you know, love our neighbor better. Um, he was brought as a lamb to the slaughter because maybe we didn't obey the law of chastity. Like we should have, um, he was taken from prison and because of this, he was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgressions of my people. And, and this is how we become, this is how he becomes our begotten father. And so I, I think that's where I would probably take my, my conversation next with him. I've been going long. So, yeah. So I think Ryan is, is giving us a really clear way through commandments we often make the mistake of teaching commandments from the point of view of the priests of Noah as these kind of standalone goods in and of themselves. The whole reason that Abinadi is quoting the law of Moses here is to make the point that these are all types of Jesus Christ, that they're all supposed to point us to Jesus Christ. And he uses this phrase over and over again, that God himself, right? That God himself will do these things, that God himself will make an atonement. Um, and, and that's something we've talked about it before, but that's something that we take for granted that Jehovah is Jesus Christ, but that's not something that this people understands. And so they've hit him with Isaiah 52, seven through 10. He's going to come right back at him with, like Ryan said, Isaiah 53, which is called the song of the suffering servant, which is this really beautiful poem 
about the suffering that Christ is going to endure. Um, and, and that's going to be his bridge. There's this line in the Song of the Sufferings from verse 8 of chapter 14. Who shall declare his generation? And he's going to use that phrase to bridge us into chapter 15 to talk about this mystery of how God himself can come and sacrifice for us. Um, Joe Spencer, who's a scholar uh, at BYU, he says this about, uh, about Abinadi's um, teachings in chapter 15. He says, Abinadi thus seems fully to recognize at the outset of his exposition that he has the task of making a profound mystery clear to the, an uncomprehending audience. He employs the metaphor of paternity. God is God's own father and God's own son. And so the process through which God becomes an enfleshed human being can be described as generation, as the production of progeny. Of course, this particular production of progeny is paradoxical because the father in question is the son in question. Yet the relationship between a father and son is supposed to help explain the dual nature of God in the flesh, who is at once the father because he was conceived by the power of God and the son because he dwelleth in the flesh. There, there's a lot of ways that I've heard kind of explain why Abinadi calls Jesus the father and the son. Uh, but I think a lot of those explanations come from our 21st century restoration mind of trying to solve the problem of the Trinity and things like that. Abinadi is not doing that. Abinadi is saying God is going to be born a human being and he is going to be the sacrifice that allows us to, to experience all the blessings that are promised in Isaiah 52. Yeah. Um, be, be very clear that the God that Abinadi is talking about is the old Testament God, Jehovah. That's their concept of who God is. Exactly. So teachers be very clear that this is not a Godhead chapter. This is a Jesus chapter. This is the only God they know is Jehovah. So how is Jesus fully God and fully human? That's more of a, a an accurate question. And how is he using this kind of this example of paternity, this generation, this idea of generation to explain that? This is a mystery that we could think about a little bit more in, in the restored church. We kind of accept, you know, God, the Father, Jesus Christ, the Holy Ghost. And we don't really, we don't dwell on Jesus being made flesh and why that's such a profound uh, mystery. And and what Abinadi is saying is those who declare this, who declare his generation, who who have a witness that, that this is uh, how God will save his people, that is Christ's seed. Those prophets, those people that believe in the words of the prophets, those are going to be called the children of Christ. Yeah. And, and so really understanding who Jesus Christ is, um, is at the center of, of us becoming his seed. I, uh, there's, there's a couple of things coming at uh, just in my own personal. Uh, these, these chapters for me are intensely temple speak. Uh, Abinadi is so concerned that we understand that when we talk about salvation, as he says in chapter uh, 13, and he says, salvation doth not come, this is 28, does not come by the law alone, uh, were it not for the atonement, which God himself, there it is again, uh, shall make for the sins and iniquities of his people. He, he gives such a great definition of what it means to be saved through the atonement of Christ where he's going to lay it out as this is going to be both redemption from sin and resurrection from death. And, and that is, if, if we're going to talk about our students preparing themselves for the temple, I can't think of a better doctrine to get squarely planted in their minds and in their hearts than that Jesus Christ is our savior and redeemer because he helps us overcome death and hell, like Nephi says. But in this case, redemption and resurrection was which is now now explicitly stated in the endowment and is a great way to start to be 
um, very transparent that guys, when we go into the temple, this is what the temple's teaching us. Abinadi is teaching what you're going to learn in the endowment. It's all about how Christ is going to redeem us and how he's going to save us from death through resurrection. And here it's just laid out so beautifully as he puts that forward. Um, I'd also say this, as much as I love Mo Mosiah chapter five, verse seven, here it is again, where Abinadi is going to get right in line with what King Benjamin was trying to teach. I've heard somebody opine that maybe Abinadi was King Benjamin's angel that taught him some of that doctrine before. It's a bit of a jump, but here you have them teaching the same thing where he starts talking about, hey, when he has offered his soul, when his soul has been made an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. And now what say ye? Who shall be his seed? And then he makes this really great argument as um, this is whosoever has heard the word of the prophets. This is verse 11. Um, all the holy prophets have prophesied concerning the coming of the Lord. I say unto you, all those who have hearkened to their words, these are his seed, or they are heirs of the kingdom of God. Um, uh, for these are they whose sins he has borne, and, and are they for whom he has died and redeemed them from transgression? Are they not his seed? And he says that several times as he works through that. And it's again, it's this declaration that when we have entered into this type of relationship with Christ, we are spiritually begotten of him. We become his sons and his daughters. Well, and, and what's the idea that he is correcting here? It's that these people are chosen because of their heritage. Right. Because of because of their family, because of who their ancestors are. And and he's putting Christ right in the middle of that and saying, if you want to receive the blessings promised to Abraham, you have to become the seed of of christ because he he is the heir of abraham right he's the one that's going to fulfill those blessings and we do the same thing members of the church hey we're members of the church right it doesn't that pioneer mean stock still, yeah we're pioneer stock or whatever it might be and there's a there's a correct way to an, honor our ancestors but being a member of the church does not mean that we have been we, we are christ's seed right that that takes us coming to christ and, and having this law written in our hearts and being redeemed of him. It takes real work. There's there's a there's a question of relevance that that gets kind of resolved in in these uh in these verses. Um that this this idea of seed, we're gonna we keep using that phrase seed, and our students are, are gonna make the quite fully the connection that maybe we want them to do. And what if we just what if we said it was family? Yeah. You, you want to be a part of my family, right? If the, the biggest source of belonging that most people have is, is their family. Now we also have many that struggle because they don't feel like they belong in a family or their family is something they don't feel like they want to belong to. And so they feel somewhat lost or maybe, you know, they, they feel like they're going to, they're going to miss out because, and, and we, and I hear this all the time from youth where they, they get kind of confused in the topics of, um, you know, my parents are divorced. And so who am I going to belong to? And, you know, and, and anyway, so those, those kinds of questions pop up and, and, you know, chapter 15 verses 14 through 18 are the most relevant and probably the greatest sense of belonging that we can gain that when, when, when we are identified as, as the seed. So, and these his seed or his family are they who who publish peace. They're the ones that bring the good tidings. They publish salvation, right? How beautiful upon the mountains were their feet or his seed, like his family. When we when we have a family reunion, at least in, like in my family, the last time we got together for a big family reunion was in Coraline, Idaho, and my brother decided it would be a good idea to have these these T-shirts made that have the name Anderson emblazoned across the front, and then and then we had a number um attached bit which was the number uh associated with um the the order that we became andersons and so obviously mom and dad were one and two and because i was the oldest i was number three and, and that number went all the way down with all the in-laws and all the kids all the way down i think at that time it was like 32 and 33 um because my brother was he just announced he was having twins and and yeah, you know, we still wear we still wear these t-shirts like 
you know, five, six years later, like when we're together, like we'll still wear these t-shirts um, for, for a lot of different reasons. But it is, again, it's this connection. We are part of this family. And we also have similar things that we do when we go to the temple. We'll wear a temple garment because it's a symbol that we are that we are clothed in Christ. We are taking Christ upon us. We are part of his family. Um, we, we might wear a piece of jewelry that has either a picture of a temple or maybe it's a locket that has an ancestor in it, even the cross. Um, we gather together every week to eat together. We gather together and have a, yeah, we, we, we partake of a meal in our families. Um, and the first resurrection is going to be all of the family of God who are, who have accepted Christ as their father, this begotten idea of, of, of a, of a father figure. Um, we all get to come forth in the first resurrection together for this huge family reunion. And, you know, we don't want any empty seats at the family reunion. We don't want anybody that's, that can't make the trip for one reason or another. We don't want anybody left out. Um, we want to belong to this family. Yeah. Um, before, before we jump to just to talk about Alma real quick, you know, he brings it back to Isaiah 52, seven through 10 again, because he answers their question. He finally answers their question. And, and I think it's important to understand what Isaiah is saying in that verse. The context of that verse is that Jerusalem has been destroyed, right? The temple has been destroyed. The people have been carried away. And so Jerusalem is now a waste place. It's a conquered people. This is supposed to be God's chosen people. And, and now they've been overthrown and scattered. And then in the hills surrounding Jerusalem, there comes a messenger running, carrying a message. And somewhere in some far off battle, there's been a victory won. And that messenger is carrying the message of the victory. And so, he, he, you know, the watchman on the tower sees the messenger coming over the hill and this messenger says victory. Right. And and his feet are battered because he's run all that way. But how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of that messenger, because he's he's bringing the news that God is on his throne again, that we are being restored. And and there's a literal application to to Jerusalem and in a context there. But this this life will leave us all with waste places, with destroyed hopes and dreams or relationships or regrets or wounds or all of those things. And and when the messenger declares the gospel, when we receive that gospel message, those things can be restored and Christ can heal every single one of those waste places so that we can see eye to eye and break forth in songs of joy. And then when we are gathered in, Abinadi is saying we are the messengers on, on the mountaintops for other people. We are the ones who are bringing the good news and who are publishing peace in other people's lives that have been laid waste by mortality. And how beautiful upon the mountain are our feet and how beautiful upon the mountain are Christ's feet because he is the ultimate messenger of the good news. And, and that's part of the, the apostasy turned Christianity into about our own personal salvation. And sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that Christianity is about our own personal salvation but right here, Abinadi is, is making that next change and saying, as you have been gathered, it is now your right mandate, privilege, responsibility to go and declare and to gather others. Yeah. And, and that purpose is something we need to leave our youth with because it's exactly what Alma then takes this message and goes and does. And, and Abinadi, who is killed before he gets to see the fruit of all of his labor, it will be praised generation by generation how beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of Abinadi for the message of good news that he brought and, and that so many heard. Yeah, he uh, uh, the way he he describes that, how beautiful upon the mountains were their feet, are their feet, uh, will they be from this time henceforth, and how beautiful upon the mountain are the feet of him who bringeth good tidings that is the founder of peace even the Lord who has redeemed his people, who have granted salvation unto his people, 
and redeem. Uh, and then, and then it's almost like he, okay, I just answered it. This is what it means. Anybody who is publishing this message and then almost like a nail in the coffin is verse is chapter 16, where he's like in here, let me go ahead and be those beautiful feet that you accuse me of not having. Cause then he goes and he declares redemption from sin and salvation from death through the resurrection, exclamation mark. I have just proclaimed to you the good news. And then they get mad and they burn them like that. <laughs> he does the two things. I've delivered, I've answered your question. I delivered the message. Yep. And my feet are beautiful. Yeah. And what you do to me now doesn't, doesn't matter anymore. I did. I did write. I did write the question above in, in chapter 15. I said at this very moment, how beautiful are Alma's feet, right? In chapter 15. Um, and when do they become beautiful? Well, you start to see that happen in verse in chapter 17, where Alma's like, all right, guys, I think he's kind of got a point. And he's got to run away. And he then takes up that prophetic mantle and his feet start to become beautiful because he starts proclaiming that same message. And our prophets today get a lot of blowback for for the gospel that they preach to the world because because the false idols that are being worshipped today they still include money they still include sex they still include power all of those things don't change right and and because the prophets bring a message of faith in Jesus Christ and repentance they they often get blowback from it um even from members of the church um that there's no more chaotic time on my Facebook page than general conference where, where I have people that are, that are openly critical of kind of every talk that's given, but what's the, what's the good news that they're bringing? They're bringing the, the message of redemption and of resurrection and of eternal families and of being part of Christ's family. And, and that's what, that's, that's what prophets have always declared. And it's what prophets will continue to declare and and setting that expectation for our kids and 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 making that connection is a useful connection because there are a lot of other voices that are commenting on prophets in their life, um, and and they fit right in line with Abinadi. Well, I don't you see why we love Abinadi. <laughs> you see, yeah. you see why we want more than just three days on this? All five days. <laughs> <laughs> Because because you could this could very easily be one of those weeks where you're you're gonna pick out themes that can go across each day and keep coming back to it with different elements of it, or if you want to take each one kind of on its own. But yeah, I, there's so much here, um, and and like any good witness, he seals it with his own life and his own blood, and um, yeah. So good luck keeping it in five days. I'll be honest, that's. Yeah, this is a two weeker for sure. <laughs> <laughs> but but and we can leave our kids with a kind of foreshadowing of what's to come. Not just Alma, but Alma's people. This is gonna be for Mormon as the recorder. This is gonna be the idyllic people. And he's gonna because his namesake, right? The waters of Mormon, that's where they're gathering. And Mormon in his context of being that kind of lone voice, the lone messenger. He's going to think back on the church at, at the waters of Mormon and how faithful and righteous they were. And he's going to long for those days. And so this really does set up um, the rest of the Book of Mormon right here as well. This, this changes the socioeconomic and political um, yeah. structures of, of the Nephi nation. Like yeah. this, this, this church that gets founded can't exist in a monarchy because we've just seen what happens when you get a bad king even good kings it's you, you can do really good but as soon as you get a bad king in it undoes it undoes all of your efforts i mean just look at xenophon's on a high note noah within 10 years everything is, is a mess yeah. and so it forces it forces king mosiah to have to look differently if i want to protect this organization this new in, in, uh, institution called the church then, then our government has to be different now. Yeah, and we, have to, we have to check the rights of the people. Any any time we see church from here on out, this is the beginnings. Is what what Alma does with a Benedict's message. So, all right. Well, we probably got to let you go. Otherwise, we'll just keep on going. Um, 
<laughs> this is going to be one of those. So do the best you can with what you got. And uh, let us know if you have any questions or concerns.